Hello again, and welcome back to the Bitcoin Magazine podcast. I'm Graham, and sitting across from me is old Dave. How's it going, everyone? <laughs> hope you're all well, and uh, we hope you had a great Independence Day. Mine was quite free. I uh, I definitely felt the freedom, for sure. And I didn't blow off any fingers, so, uh, you know, got all my digits. That's that's good. Today, we're going to talk about something that hasn't really gotten a lot of the attention that it actually deserves. That's the FATF's new guidelines for cryptocurrency. Oh, um, Dave, take us away. Yeah, so the FATF, or Financial Action Task Force, is basically this international regulatory organization that makes global policy recommendations to help nations prevent money laundering, terrorist financing, nefarious activities, that sort of thing. Ooh, it's pretty long-winded. On June 21st, the FATF went public with their guidelines on how governments should regulate cryptocurrency. Simon Lelevelt, a Amsterdam-based regulatory consultant, has been speaking out against these new recommendations for several months. I spoke with him two weeks back during the same week that Facebook's Libra coin went public. Well, I think we're in a historical week, as this is the week where um, the ministries of finance of the world are basically finalizing those uh, recommendations. They've been preparing for over a year, so so uh, it's happening right now, I would say. Simon does approve of regulations in many instances, for example, the EU's GDPR laws. And after all, he makes his career off of knowing how regulations work. Let's start with the good thing. Uh, it's a logical thing that uh, as financial regulators, you will want to make sure that any value that's being transferred in too, too much amount is some, somewhere somehow on your radar. Um, and you can do that in a couple of ways. So, so integrating virtual assets into your regulatory framework is by itself not, not spectacular or exciting. I mean, if, if in the Netherlands you go to a jeweler and you buy for 30,000 euros a, a golden watch, that jeweler will have to notify authorities and, and say, well, this is a transaction of high value and so on. So, so doing that for virtual assets is, is not by definition a problem. Simply put, Simon thinks the FATF has gone overboard, way overboard with their crypto guidelines. They're overshooting. Uh, they haven't defined the subject of regulation properly. Uh, if they were to say, well, we are only regulating virtual currencies and we're only requiring very specific information to be available on demand, that would not, not, not defin by definition be a problem. I mean, there, there, there might be a legitimate reason to do so. But what they are doing is they're, they're using a very wide definition, which basically says virtual asset is anything that moves or represents a value in society. That's too broad in my sense. Um, and they're over-expanding in the sense that they say, please send by default all the information of customers within the transactions. Now they understand you can't do that with a blockchain protocol, the, the, the BIP won't be uh, uh, agreed to by any node. So, so they say, oh, oh, by the way, you don't really have to throw the information in the transaction, but build an overlay structure where you send it along towards the other entity in the value chain. So they're demanding bank-like export of personal data and um, that's, that's pretty much to ask. I think too much to ask. In case you didn't already know, telecos are gigantic telecommunications companies like AT&T or Vodafone who store massive amounts of user data. Simon believes that these guidelines are too much to ask for from cryptocurrency companies and says it's likely a violation of the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which in a nutshell says people have the right to be safe and secure in their homes. Their effects, papers, and from unreasonable searches and seizures. It's too much to ask because if you look at the Fourth Amendment in the US and if you look at the uh, Carpenter ruling of the Supreme Court, uh, this is based on uh, telco information. Uh, if we ask telcos to collect information of private citizens, uh, which are innocent citizens, and we ask them to collect it and retain it for possible future use to catch thieves or crooks or criminals, that is too much. And that's, there's a ruling of the U.S. Supreme Court on that. There's also in Europe an equivalent ruling on a Taylor II case, also in the telco area. Uh, you can't go around uh, retaining, uh, and, and we're not even asking, uh, uh, talking about sending, but you, you can't even go around retaining the data of customers that are innocent because sometimes, somewhere, somehow, a crooked criminal can, can occur. You, that, that's too broad uh, an expansion of your uh, government uh, powers. So that's... And that's been set in stone by, by these rulings. So they're, they're really overshooting. Um, and, and 
ignoring these relevant uh, privacy rulings of, of the Supreme Court and the uh, EU Court of Justice. And that's, I think, uh, a government official, uh, even when working to catch criminals, should still respect the other government officials that also do their work. On Twitter and his personal blog, Leuvelt has been saying violating privacy is only one part of the potential problems created by these guidelines. In summary, he calls them fundamentally disproportionate, unsound, and uneconomic. Now, I'm not a regulatory consultant guy, but that sounds like an overreach to me. The root of Leuvelt's critique of this proposal is this specific section called 7B, which he says is the largest threat to the cryptocurrency space today. Okay, so this article 7B uh, basically says... Um, If you send virtual assets, which are then broadly defined, but you must attach, uh, just like banks do with international wire transfers, you must attach the name of the people involved. Uh, And you transfer them to the beneficiary uh, virtual asset provider. And it also says, and to any counterparts, if any. Well, if I read this in a blockchain world, it sounds pretty much like if you're setting up a virtual asset system or a virtual currency system and you have notes or validator notes or you have counterparties to the transaction but also counterparties in the blockchain uh, it sounds as if you're basically exporting customer data which which by itself everyone in the crypto world agrees that it's stupid to throw in names in a blockchain protocol because in 10 years time the, the encryption will be hacked so it's public data so you don't want to throw around names uh, uh, just as the fatf orders and that's that's uh, that's a very, very silly thing to do or to demand uh, from, from the virtual currency world. Lillevelt isn't saying that KYC is too much to ask for from cryptocurrency exchanges. He's saying the FATF is advocating for something far more intrusive and potentially dangerous. Essentially, it means that every cryptocurrency exchange has to share customer data when a customer transfers funds to another exchange or personal wallet. This begs the question, are the FATF's guidelines even feasible? Well, there, there are, you could say, at the endpoints of the uh, exchanges or the virtual asset providers, you could create a system where you say, I want to know my customer. Well, everyone is, is, is doing so because if you want to remain keeping your operating your bank account, the bank will ask you to do so. So you'll do KYC, you do transaction monitoring. And of course, you can also request before allowing a, a currency transfer, you can request someone to provide the name of, of the entity that the money is going to be sent to. Um, there's, there's stuff that at the endpoints that you could do, then there, there's also the possibility that exchanges and the uh, virtual asset providers start cooperating on a collective system to share the information. So in a technical sense, you could say, well, it's going to be hugely costly, but it is possible. And then that's exactly what the FATF says. Oh, look, there are already a couple of guys building it. So it's possible. Whether or not it's technically possible, Lelevelt thinks the FATF solution has a disproportionately bigger cost than what they see as the potential problem with privacy in cryptocurrency. So if governments decide to follow these recommendations, which it sounds like they always do, what are the costs? It's going to be a huge coordination cost and technical cost to build the system if you would want to build it. Um, uh, and there, there's the, 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 I would say the, the spirit of the requirement sort of goes against what what cryptocurrency is all about. It's about um, taking, ba- basically giving power to the people who use virtual currencies, which means shielding them off from too much government intervention. And in spirit, uh, this is a bit too far. Even, even if you look at the regulations from the UN, United Nations resolutions on privacy in the digital age, this is too much. It's, it's beyond what a government m- might want to ask. And that's, uh, that's where, in spirit, I think it's 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 harmful to uh, to the ecosystem. It's it's, it's uh, so it's a cost thing primarily and uh, a privacy thing uh, also primarily. I would say. Simon also points out that these guidelines could potentially create a large scale security problem. Uh, in the end, you 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 can be sure. Technically, I mean, I, I think uh, it's been last week that the U.S. Customs database has been hacked. There's, there's basically by definition, if you're going to demand this kind of systems, if you demand the, the uh, storage and retainment of, of personal data, somewhere along the chain, someone is going to uh, lose it and, and then you've got a data breach. So who's going to have to phone who about this data breach? You're, for certain, there's going to be data breaches. And for certain, you're throwing away uh, very personal, sensitive data of people who are completely innocent into the public domain. So you're basically 
basically making a hole in the dikes, letting the water filter through because there's perhaps one fish that you want to catch. It's, it's not, not a good idea. But there is a hope. Simon believes there's a legitimate argument to be made for why cryptocurrency companies shouldn't have to bend the knee to the FATF's guidelines. Well, I think there is. I think the crypto community could very simply say, um, as long as we don't have harmonized definitions on crypto assets worldwide, as long as we don't have unified legal regimes, we are not in a position to, in, to implement this measure worldwide because what's crypto in one country is not crypto in, other, in another country. So, uh, and we also are unable to comply with all the data protection regulation of those other countries in cases where the country doesn't feel that it's a virtual currency. So we will want to honor the FATF requirement, but technically we will be using the domestic wire transfer regime. So what happens if crypto companies don't want to bend the knee to these regulations? Well, it depends on the region. For the U.S. Uh, for the U.S. players, uh, I think there's there's a major risk in the sense that already right now they are, are regulated as money trans- transfer businesses. Technically speaking, the rule might already be applying to them uh, for four years, but it hasn't been enforced yet. So if they don't want to listen, the supervisor could just say, "Well, sorry, you haven't been listening for four years, and now it's the fifth year, so I'm going to hit you with a huge fine, some some fine like you're out of business almost." So there's pretty much at stake. Uh, there's a high risk. Um, and uh, that could be the reality of supervision for US players. And then in the other countries in the world um, and, and regions, it's, it really depends upon the local uh, authorities. In Europe, we will take the FATF recommendation, have a look at it, and then see how can we make it work under EU regulation. And there's still room for the European Commission to perhaps say, well, sorry, FATF, nice try, but we're not going for it. Um, so, so it depends on, on the region and the local, le- local legal authorities uh, how far they want to go and how far they want to stray from what the FATF uh, intends to do. More than likely, in places like the U.S., companies will have to either comply or relocate. On the other hand, European exchanges might fare better. That's because, as Simon has laid out, these recommendations seem to violate the EU's GDPR privacy laws. About a week after my conversation with Simon, world leaders at the G20 summit declared their intent to comply with the FATF's guidelines. So this is a bad thing, right? Yep. Which leads to another point Simon wanted to drive home, the geopolitical ramifications of all of this. Given the definition of virtual asset, which is so wide, and basically anything that is being tokenized in the future will be subject to this. So it's not just virtual currency, it's anything that you can tokenize. Um, And if you say we're going to monitor this and we're going to retain all the transaction data and and you must send it out through the whole world, um, then what you're effectively doing is the digital equivalent of hanging uh, security cameras at each economic transaction. It's not just hanging uh, security cameras in a public space where everyone can see them. No, it's hanging them at the location of each. It's almost like snooping the the pin code for for a transaction at the point of sale. Um, but you're, you leave it, you just don't, you're not interested in the pin code, you're interest, interested in the transaction data. So it's, it's a, a worldwide surveillance mechanism for all economic transactions. And that's also what has been behind the rule uh, that banks were, were, were asked to comply with in uh, 2004 and 2005. This was never about criminality. This was always about um, uh, FBI asking to know everything that's going on economically. It's the FBI asking uh, Apple, open up your operating system. We want to see what happens. It's it's a standard feature for for, um, uh, counterintelligence and uh, criminal seekers, let's let's call them this, to want more information and to get to the heart with back doors, front doors, or or what have you. And that's their role. They should ask for it, but there's also entities that should just deny it and say, I understand you want it, but you're not going to get it. So that's that's the balance that we're seeking in a political sense, I think. Are these guidelines impinging on a human rights violation? Simon seems to think they could, which circles back to this ongoing issue of online privacy that's been heavily debated since the dawn of the Internet age. They are an indirect violation to human rights principles. There's a UN resolution on digital rights, uh, the right to privacy in a digital age. Um, and I would certainly hold that this retaining information of people that are innocent, um, this is, comes to the heart of the Fourth Amendment in the U.S. I'm, I'm, I don't know all the amendments, but I looked this one up. 
this is innocent data of innocent people and it's going to be leaked out everywhere and it's going to be harmful in, in any way or the other. And um, there is a, a fundamental tension with the uh, human rights. And uh, I think this, this one's beyond uh, what's appropriate. How would this affect cryptocurrency users? Well, this is important. Simon says it'll move a lot of people and companies into the realm of peer-to-peer -peer cryptocurrency sending and receiving. So if you're struggling with this whole concept of what the guidelines entail for sending and receiving like I am, think of it as any kind of transaction where you move money on or off an exchange that holds your funds. It would be like if every time you moved your crypto from a trading account to a personal wallet, that information would be reported to a large group of third parties. So what you, what you can do if you want to prevent this kind of future is, is see that the, at present the FATF regulation doesn't uh, cover the whole of the market. It covers the professional entities in the market. So there's still a peer-to-peer -peer community area where you can have your own wallet. You can transact with whomever you want. Um, and that won't be subject to regulation um, because that's the personal domain. Uh, now the question is how long is that going to be free of regulation? but there is still the opportunity on a private basis to do so. But once you, you start doing this so much that you make money out of it and it becomes a business, then you will be subject to those rules. But there's still the, the private wallet area where you can do whatever you want. Uh, then again, as soon as you want to turn some of your wallet and you want to convert some of your currency and you need an exchange to do so, then you will hop into the regulated uh, domain uh, and you will have to ask yourself the question, do I want to be in that domain, yes or no? Uh, so, so there is there is a sort of hope, but there's the, there's there's and and that's basically also the expectation uh, of the counter effect or the side effect of the of this FATF regulation. It basically pushes a lot of things that the FATF doesn't want uh, towards this peer to peer domain. So, so you don't see it. So, so you're happy and you're obliging all good willing people to measures that don't have effect, while the people who are well, well, the counter effect, the thing that you want to observe or want to get hold of moves to another domain so so in, in that sense it's also a very understandable but silly uh, idea these guidelines could effectively split the cryptocurrency community into a kind of black and white economy we could expect to see decentralized exchange models taking off more rapidly than ever but these bigger newer players will definitely follow the regulations the funny thing is because this is a very historical week because we also have Facebook, of course, announcing their, their worldwide uh, e-money tokens. Um, so while we are looking at this very detailed uh, from a financial stability point of view, completely irrelevant uh, cryptocurrency set, uh, we have a from a financial stability point of view, very important player, Facebook, who's going to live by the book and who's going to apply this rule. And it's going to send coins and transactions throughout the world and say, oh, yeah, sorry, I've got to put the name in it because the FATF wants me to. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. You're having consent everywhere you want to throw this Facebook coin, this Libra coin. But yeah, you know, law enforcement, I need to send your personal data with it. Yeah, sorry. Bye-bye. And good luck, uh, Cambridge Analytica or your successor. <laughs> Have a go at it. Bye-bye. That's, that's, the, that's the sad element. The focus and the energy is too much on an irrelevant part of the market in terms of uh, priorities in, in the sense of human rights and privacy. Simon was actually thinking about a Facebook coin years before most of us were. In 2016, he read an article about Facebook getting their e-money license in Ireland. Reflecting back to that time, I was curious what has changed in his mind about a Facebook coin. Well, my, my concern or my idea was that, that Facebook was never going to be able to jump through the hoop of trustworthiness with the public, given their, um, their improper treatment of personal data, given their involvement in, in, uh, in, in sending out media messages to the work world, which are not perhaps truly true or in adapting ad campaigns. I, my idea was if, if Facebook were to be a person and that person would say, I'm the bank director of your new bank, you would say, no, you disqualify. Your past is, is blemished and uh, you're not allowed to, to become a bank director. Now, Facebook is not a person, but, but an entity. And I think the trust issue is still there. Um, it was then, it is, it is also now uh, present, and that's why regulators and politicians all over the world want hearings and want to say, well, what's happening here? Please stop this, this development of Libra in its track, because there's, there's, we, we do have an issue. I think the issue is not technically with the question, 
can they issue a financial product or can they do this properly or soundly? But there's really a trust issue at hand um, and the power issue because there, there, there's not been, if you look, if you compare to the development of uh, the Visa card system, uh, basically what Facebook is doing is, is sort of the same. Uh, the Visa card system started out with Bank of America uh, having a smart system and using technology like cards and networks, which were hip and new and happening and create a system where you can quickly uh, do credit scoring and transactions. And it was way better than the paper-based world that we had until then. So that's cool. And they even had this disruptive framework like chaotic age and chaotic management. They, they were the disruptors of their time. So one company started with a product and then built an ecosystem, which we now call Visa and MasterCard, to support it. Facebook is ex doing exactly the same. They, they're putting in the product, they're putting in the ecosystem around it, but they're doing it much faster than they did before. Uh, and I think this, the new thing uh, for me um, is that I'm placing the development of Facebook Cash or Libra Coin, or how you want to label it, into this historical context. It's basically the, the new age or the, 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 the new technology style of setting up a scheme, a payment scheme. And that's what they're doing. They're setting up a payment scheme. And the one thing that may escape uh, attention is that it's not just about a currency thing, but by choosing a basket of different currencies, they, they basically, the Libra, they want the Libra to become the unit of account. They want it to supersede dollars, euros, and yens. So their game is not just at payment mechanisms. Their, their game is at the heart of our minds. In our minds, we should start thinking in Libra. That's basically what, they, what they're going for in their approach. And that's, um, that's one that I did not envisage when I wrote the article in 2016. I just figured, well, it's a big player. They can set up a third scheme like Visa and MasterCard, and that's about it. But the new thing is that they basically also want to create us think about Libra as a currency and as a unit of account. But a compromise might be struck by innovation from the private sector. Colin Harper, a Bitcoin Magazine staff writer, reports, the blockchain analytics company CypherTrace and attestation platform Shift are developing an anonymous identity protocol, which the partners claim will allow crypto service providers to share information without disclosing user identity. This would mean keeping regulators happy without having to sacrifice sensitive client information. Only time will tell if regulators will agree. That's it for today's episode. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next time. The Bitcoin Magazine podcast is a BTC media produced podcast on the Let's Talk Bitcoin network. Today's episode was produced and edited by myself and Dave. Theme music provided by Billy Sly from the Crypto Cantina. Special thanks to our guest, Simon Leilavelt and Satoshi Nakamoto. We are eternally grateful. Visit BitcoinMagazine.com for more in-depth news, analysis, and resources about the most successful peer-to-peer -peer currency. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, at Bitcoin Magazine. You can find more engaging crypto podcasts over at Let'sTalkBitcoin.com, and you can follow them on Twitter, at the LTV Network, for all the latest episodes. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the Apple Podcast app, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And if you got the time, please leave us a review. It really helps us improve the show and reach new listeners. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you next week.